Chapter 24 Dave grinned as he shook Sam's hand and presented her with a computer-printed, framed award. The militia didn't have the wherewithal for medals and resorted to other methods of recognition. In this case, it was an award ceremony in the gym of the local high school. There wasn't an empty seat in the place. As the crowd applauded, Sam blushed and went to join the rest of the awardees on the stage. As she did, the crowd stood to give a standing ovation to the 23 people on stage, all being recognized for their assistance in the war effort, from Mrs. McGee, the teacher who was instrumental in setting up the local schools with little gas to spare, the one-room schoolhouse was back in vogue, to Doc, whose commo net was considered instrumental in saving more than one infant whose mom was having a tough labor, among its other successes. Dave waited a few minutes for the crowd to show its appreciation and for the awardees to bask in the limelight. As the crowd settled down, Dave announced, That's it for now, folks. If our distinguished guests, he nodded towards the awardees, would like to sit down, Jim and I would like to address everyone before we go. Jim was walking up the stairs to the stage. Hold it right there, Dave, Jim pointed at the awardees. There should be one more person there. Dave looked at the list in his hands. He was sure he had gotten everyone. At least he had given out all the awards they had made up. Dave McGrath, attention to orders, barked Jim. Dave snapped to attention, more out of habit than anything else. After all these years, some things were still reflex. For single-handedly destroying the Red Baron's reign of terror over our beloved valley, the Pine Tree Irregulars present you with the Order of Snoopy, first class. He walked up to Dave and held up the award for the crowd to see. Dave grinned. It was a Snoopy pin, the beagle wearing his aviator's hat with scarf and swagger stick. Behind was affixed a red, white, and blue ribbon. Jim pinned it on Dave and then told the town, As you know, Dave here single-handedly shot down a German Cobra attack helicopter with an anti-tank rocket and almost fried himself doing so. In fact, I think his legs are still smoking from that stunt. The crowd laughed. Dave grimaced. His legs did still sting a bit. And Dave didn't even know he hit the damn thing until we told him in the AAR two days later. More laughter. No one had been more surprised than Dave had been when he was thanked by a man from the other side of the horseshoe for knocking out the snake. Seventeen people had died in their bunkers from direct 2.7 in 2.75 inch rocket hits. <clears throat> all right, enough of that. You guys should all go home and not celebrate. I put you all on patrol tonight, said Jim affectionately. The wardies all laughed as they filed off the stage. NHDF had told the units in the southern half of the state to accept a large assault by the ISAF forces. Their moles within ISAF as well as reports from the occupied areas, had all reported large buildups of vehicles and men in the last few weeks. The basic plan was for the NHDF line units to do what they could to stop them, but they didn't have the troops or transports to fight a regular war against a large ISAF army. The plan that evolved was for the militia to fight a guerrilla war against the ISAF, hit and run all the way. The NHDF would pick a time and place to dig in and hold, and the guerrillas would pick away at the ISAF flanks and rear areas as they could. One contingency even called for militia units to infiltrate south and wage war deep in the enemy's rear areas. <clears throat> to this end, the militia worked on decentralizing. They organized as many men and women as they could into two-man teams, each armed with at least one scoped high-powered rifle. They still encouraged teams of friends for organization into larger teams. These ranged from 6 to 32 people. Other teams were organized too. Medical units, commo, transport, safe houses, cacheting teams, depending on the capabilities of the volunteers. Some folks were simply not in any condition to fight on the front lines. Too old, debilitating illnesses and infirmities, or other handicaps. But a man who couldn't run 50 yards on an arthritic knee could drive an F-250 full of supplies back and forth or work in an aid station. Dave and his crew, with Jim and a three-person staff, Sam for Camo, 
Will, the EMT, as medical chief, and Jim's father, Charlie, as supply NCO and driver, planned to operate together as much as they could. To a man, they all carried fully automatic CAR 15s or M4s, and almost all the teams had two scope precision rifles. Steve had a single shot 50, and his team consisted of three men to support the heavy weapon. Dave and Tony were a team. Tony had left his beloved G36 with Sandy and carried a captured M4 carbine. Dave had swapped out the three round burst mechanism for a spare set of M16 internals. As he told Tony, if you need to rock and roll, you don't need three round burst. You might need a 30 round burst. They carried Dave's Remington PSS and 308 as well. Tony carried a camouflage rubber armored spotting scope that was Dave's, as well as a 10 meter radio and a battery with a solar charger. Dave and Tony had packed their rucks the same way. Dave using his trusty civilian pack he had humped from Connecticut, Tony using his civvy pack, long hence dyed black. The packs were loaded identically, as were all of the militias. In the bottom, they each carried a sleeping bag and a waterproof bag. In the left side pouch was a first aid kit, bandoler 223 ammo, and a poncho or other rain gear. In the right side pouch was a weapons cleaning kit, hygiene kit, spare socks and foot powder, and toilet paper. In the top flap pouch was a claymore mine, heat tabs, and a stripped MRE. In the main compartment flap pouch was a heavy space blanket and maps of their AO. In the main compartment they carried, by SOP, at least one spare pair of pants, five pair of clean socks, a spare t-shirt, black watch cap, a jacket or heavy shirt of some type, more ammo, a poncho, and 550 cord for shelter and food. A two, a two quart canteen was carried on the outside of the pack unless the person had a camelback type bladder in their pack. Dave and Tony also had spare saw ammo, had a spare saw ammo pouch clipped onto the outside compression strap that carried between them spare match 308 ammo, camo cream, a pocket bible, smoke grenades, three skyrocket signal flares, booby trap wire, and seven improvised booby traps, knife steel, duct tape, 550 cord, butane lighters, sewing kit, and a small mirror. In their top left pockets they carried a small notebook and pencils. In the right was a small compass. Additionally, they all carried pocket knives and or multi-tools in their pants, along with a fire starter. Dave and Tony each had a magnesium block with a port short piece of hacksaw blade attached, and these were dummy corded to a belt loop. Dave and Tony each wore USGI LBEs. Tony, being largely equipped from Dave's stock of extra LBE, had squirreled away just in case. Dave's consisted of four 3 by 30 round ammo pouches, a large accessory pouch which was sold as a hunting pouch at large retailers before the crisis. Dave found it ideal for empty mags, a small flashlight, his multi-tool, camo cream, and whatever else he might need. Also, two one-quart canteens with cups and a canteen stove, three first aid pouches, two with two pressure dressings each, the third with a 20-round magazine of tracer. A butt pack completed the ensemble. He wore the packet. When he wore the pack, it would be detached and clipped to the pack itself that enabled him to wear the pack more comfortably. In the grenade holders of the ammo pouches, Dave carried a buck nighthawk knife, a roll of black electrician's tape, some rolled 550 cord, and hanging from a carabiner, a pair of black GI leather gloves. He also carried two fragmentation grenades. In this, he carried nine AR magazines and two boxes of 308 match ammo. Tony's LBE setup was similar, and each carried a small day pack rolled up under the top of their fl f top flap of their rucks. Each also carried a neutral colored insulite pad for sleeping on or for using in a hide. Dave's PSS was carried in a GI parachutist weapons bag that was attached to his pack. It provided protection and relatively easy access. Both packs were identical, identical camouflage covers as Dave had helped Tony make one over the winter. They had a small night vision scope which had been made by taking an AMPVS-5 goggle apart, 
separating the two image intensifiers into two handheld observation devices. It operated on one AA size battery and was smaller, lighter, and had better resolution than any of the cheap sets they had tried. Each two or three man team carried one e-tool, a hatchet or saw, a water filter, and if they wanted, a small camp stove. Dave and Tony opted for more heat tabs over the stove. Dave and Tony also both carried 45 pistols with four magazines apiece. They carried no extra 45 ammo. Dave's Car 15 had a lightweight 16 inch barrel, Vortex flash hider, and tritium sights. He had been using an electronic sight but opted to take it off for this mission. Tony's M4 had a flip up sight that it had come with and mounted a small 2.5 power scope that had been designed for turkey hunting. Its reticle didn't cross, it formed a circle. Tony liked it because at close range all he had to do was put the target in the circle and pull the trigger. At longer range he had it zeroed so that he could use the bottom crosshair where it joined the circle as an aiming point. The Irregulars planned to stash their packs and using day packs and butt packs operate for two or three days away from the large rucks, returning for resupply only when they had to. This would help them remain agile and mobile in the field. So it came as no surprise when Dave was awakened one night by the emergency tone coming over his two meter base station. He woke quickly and when the signal stopped reported in as did several others. Jimmy, one of the commo volunteers, came over the air. About an hour ago a large force of ISAF forces launched a coordinated attack against southern New Hampshire in the Manchester and Portsmouth corridors. We know that NHDF forces are heavily engaged at this time. All units are ordered to disperse immediately and begin offensive operations against any and all ISAF forces. NHDF command reiterates the strategic and tactical importance of our, his voice paused, Dave figured he was turning the page on a prepared script, which is exactly what he was doing. <clears throat> Jimmy read again, mission. This message will repeat every 15 minutes for the next 90 minutes, at which time it will switch to combat communications. Jimmy's voice quivered. God bless you all and good hunting. Jimmy had added the last, and Dave knew he meant it sincerely. Dave put on sweatpants over his underwear and pulled on a pair of thick socks. It was a chilly spring morning. He went up the hall and knocked on Tony's door. After knocking a few, t few times, Rhonda's head appeared. With bleary eyes, she said, Dave, what's wrong? Come on in. <clears throat> That's okay, thanks. Can you wake up, Tony, and let him know that ISAF has invaded? They're over by Manchester, and we've got orders to deploy. Yeah, sure, Dave. I'll have him meet you downstairs. Thanks, Rhonda, Dave smiled. Rhonda smiled back sleepily. I'm going to be awfully upset when I wake him up. She shut the door quietly as Dave turned away. Dave returned to his room and woke Sandy. Briefing her as he dressed, Dave left his wallet and keys on the dresser and put on his old pair of dog tags. When Dave got downstairs, Rhonda was heating water for tea over a kerosene lamp. Tony's in the basement getting his gear, she said to Dave by way of greeting. I'll have eggs going in a minute. The stove was still warm and I threw in a couple more logs. Thanks, said Dave. He heard Sandy coming downstairs as he went to the cellar door where he met a fully laden Tony coming up. Why do they have to do this stuff at inconvenient times, he quipped. Dave laughed quietly. Just proves the ISAF are inconsiderate jerks. In a few minutes, Dave's gear joined Tony's by the door, and they sat down to an early breakfast with their wives. It was a quiet meal, as they all knew it could be the last meal they ever ate together. As they finished, Dave and Sandy went into the living room to say their goodbyes, leaving Tony and Rhonda to do the same. Sandy drove them to Jim's house, where the militia was meeting. After watching her go, Dave dropped most of his gear outside the barn, where it joined large rank of rucksacks and LBEs of those already there. We are going to deploy as a unit and set up a patrol base, Jim was saying, and then fan out to our zones from there. If you run into any as-if forces, get on the horn and let us know. We can make a hasty plan from there, depending on the size and composition of the enemy forces. <clears throat> As we've discussed, he continued, 
not against Dave as he came in. We'll fight a delaying action and try to slow them up until we can amass a force large enough to confront them. Any questions? We've covered all this before, so I don't expect too many. Sam has a bunch of papers for you, codes, brevities, and such. Remember what to do if you are compromised and forced to radio into us. Everyone nodded grimly. They had prearranged codes, words, and phrases to use if they were caught and broadcasting under duress. <clears throat> Remember, we don't know what they'll do to us if we're captured. They may treat us as guerrillas. They may treat us as POWs under the Geneva Convention. Our treatment of their prisoners may help us in that regard. <clears throat> Everyone nodded in assent. The primary goal is intel, then delay. We've got a few more people on their way, but we might as well start our inspection now. I want you all to spread out your gear outside, and Dave and I will expect it. Dave will inspect me first, and I'll do him. I know he's packed something useless, like fuzzy slippers or something. Everyone laughed and headed outside. Dave stayed behind to speak to Jim. What do you hear from NHDF? Nothing new. They're fairly busy right now in their sector, but if we have significant activity, they will send us what they can spare. Let's check these guys out. I want to be able to roll as soon as the last guys are done. Okay, let's do it. The inspection served more to determine who was short critical equipment. After re-verifying their weapon zeros on Jim's backyard range, they piled their rucks into two pickups and headed into the mountains. After a ride of some two hours, they were dropped off and headed out to their OP. Scott, your team has point. Dave, take slack. We all know where we're going, but we don't know if there are recon teams out there already. Let's keep our intervals and don't be slack. We could get ambushed on the way in or not see anything for a month. Treat it like we might get ambushed at any time. Scott and his wingman moved out, the rest of the militia filing in behind them. Dave waited for his pack to get comfortable. He always found the first hour or so the worst, as his body adjusted to the weight of the pack and his legs warmed up to the movement. He also had to get used to being dirty all the time. He found that the worst for the he found that the worst for the first two days. Then he got used to that too. He and Tony moved out last, covering their back trail. As they knew where they were going, they moved slowly, stopping frequently to cover the rear for anyone following them. Dave's inner voice drifted as his consciousness drifted. He took some comfort in the familiar feel of the LBE and weapon. This always took him back to his past. How many days and nights he had spent under the weight of similar loads. A lot more than he could remember for certain. Dave smiled. There was something happy about it to him somewhere inside. Memories of friendship forged in hardship and validation through hard work and being good at the work. He looked at Tony who was fitting right in. What a transformation he had made. In some ways, he was showing more moxie than Dave was, as he had begun with no military experience and no survival mindset. But he had acquitted himself well in the three actions he had been in. Dave smiled again. Once again, he was reverting to his inner animal, and somewhere in the primordial depths of his DNA, it was good.